Good morning. Welcome to the third webinar in our LMV3 technical training series. Our presenter again today is David Lair, Senior Tech Support Engineer and Trainer at SCC. David is going to teach us all about parameters and commissioning of a typical LMV3 linkageless control system. David, please take it away. Good morning, everyone. Today we're going to do parameters and commissioning, the heart and soul of the LMV3, the key to its flexibility. Later on, we'll do troubleshooting, VFD, and Modbus at those dates shown on your screen. We're going to use the LMV3 technical instructions. We're going to follow along with that. This is available on the website. Download as a PDF. You can get a free hard copy by contacting customer service or your sales force. And you may have already received one for the webinar today. Quick review of the wiring, the LMV3 is very flexible. Many of the wiring options are available based on your specific application. And parameter settings that we're gonna to do today can enable, disable, and even change the function of some of the terminals on the LMV3. The LMV3 parameters are broken up into three main groups by password access. The user level doesn't require a password and it encompasses basic parameters an end user might have to adjust during the use of the boiler or the burner. The service level has a password, factory default 9876, and it gives most of what the technician, the general technician setting up the boiler will do, the fuel curves, um, purge times, things like that. Finally, we have OEM level. OEM has access to all the parameters in the LMV3. The OEM default factory password is entry. And this gives you access to every single parameter that the LMV3 has. The parameters are further organized into groups. The zero and the 100s, that'd be like backup, restore, Modbus, general information, serial numbers, things like that. The two and 300s are the setup specific to the fuels. Basically, the 200s are pretty much the fuel zero, be it gas or oil, and the 300s have uh, listings for the first fuel, and that would be for the LMV36 dual fuel. 400 has one parameter, and that would be your fuel error ratio curve. The five and 600s are dedicated to the actuators, special positions, direction of rotation, ramp times, things like that. 700 is strictly your fault history, 21 faults. And the 900 is operational data, flame strength, uh, load controller, things like that, all operational data. By breaking it into groups, it kind of categorizes so you get around the parameters a little easier. We have here the AZL of the LMB3. When we look at the parameters, the parameter has actually uh, at max three pieces to the parameter. You have the raw parameter number, in this case, parameter number 186, happens to be flame failure response time. This would carry with it an index, which further details 186, so that there's different settings on 186. And finally, we have the value at the far right. So when we're setting parameters on our AZL screen, many times we'll do the parameter, but half the time we're gonna have to also have an additional index to it, and then finally, we'll refer to the actual value of the parameter setting. LMV3 starts out with an extensive listing of all the parameters in this chart. In this chart, we have the parameter number. This example is 41, 42 happens to be the passwords. We have the parameter name. So 41 would be a service level password. And we have a column for access. This would be a user level or a service level or OEM. In order to change any of these passwords, you have to log in at the OEM level. These are the default values of these parameters. Service level parameter 9876. OEM is entry. We give you the range. So the password for this service is always four characters. The password for the OEM is always five characters. And finally, we give you a description 
and tell you how to enter a new password, how to access it, and what other information we have about it. Sometimes when you get into a parameter, there's gonna be two parameters for the same value. One for fuel zero, in this case, 201, which is a fuel train. Or for fuel one, it would be parameter 301. Both of them define the fuel train, but one is dedicated to the zero fuel train and one is dedicated to fuel train one. Additionally, you see some of the parameters are shaded. Those are the ones that you will most frequently use. So the ones that are shaded are the ones that you're going to be using the most and they'll kind of draw your eye to them. Finally, some of the parameters actually have, are based on the fuel setting, fuel zero or fuel one, and the fuel type, be it gas or oil. In this case, you see there's an oil parameter 276, it would be the low oil pressure switch. And then if you were gonna do a high gas pressure switch, you would do parameter 237, whenever you're firing fuel zero. Fuel zero could be set up as either gas or oil. Fuel one can also be gas or oil. In that case, a low oil pressure switch would be parameter number 376. And a high gas pressure switch would be parameter 337. So this format allows us to give you a display of all the settings and all the descriptions and all the functions of the parameters, and then just chart the numbers according to the parameter number, whether it be general across the board, fuel specific, or fuel number and fuel type specific. Next, at the end of the parameter section, they go into the uh, sequence charts. In this case, we're gonna pick a gas train, number three, pilot GP2, the most common gas train. Gas trains number nine, 16, 21, 29 are quite similar gas trains with minor differences, and those are described in the book. In these sequence diagrams, we show you a row here of all the phases. So in red here, you see the standby and the beginning of phases coming out of phase 12. In the orange, you're gonna see the pre-purge phases. Anything in green, 40s are all the pilots. The 50s are the main light off. 60s are all the modulation, including the revert to pilot feature. And finally, 70s are the shutdowns. If you invoke gas valve proving, that would be phases in the 80s. And then if you get a low gas pressure situation, it actually comes up in the fault codes as a uh, phase 90, which would be a low gas routine. In addition to the phases, we load, list all of the terminals on the LMV3. In red, you see all of the inputs. These are all the input terminals on the LMV3. And in blue, you see all of the outputs of the LMV3 terminals. And then we give you a chart that shows you when each of the terminals during each of the phases has to be made or not made. There's a legend at the bottom explaining the chart. And in one case, you'll see when all of the terminals are energized, must be energized as an input or are energized as an output on the LMV3. Complement to that would be all the terminals that are de-energized that can't be energized during the input or on the outputs are not energized and specific phases that applies to them. Anything in white is basically a, can be an either state situation during those phases and the M's and the F's explain that it had to be made at the beginning or the end of the phases. Additionally, the LMV can be put into what's called a program stop, parameter 208, and we can halt the LMV during the pre-purge phase 24 or the ignition 20, uh, 36. Again, the ignition position, not the actual ignition. And then we can hold it during pilot or we can hold it during the main so that we can make adjustments to the gas pressure and to the air and fuel settings. Commissioning, we're gonna take a look at some of the prerequisites on the systems. We're gonna look at configuring the parameters and we're gonna look at some light off sequences and racial control curve commissioning, some suggested ways to go about it. 
prerequisites for the LMV3. The burner of the boiler must be in what we call a good condition. The scanner tube must sight the pilot, the main flame, the refractory shouldn't interfere with the sighting. The flame shouldn't impinge on the Morrison tube. The LMV3 actuators, the scanners are all mounted properly with the proper couplings that have little or no backlash and are robust enough couplings to take the small torque of all the actuators being used on the burner. Environmental conditions, such as 140 degrees maximum temperature, vibration, excessive vibration or moisture outdoor, you know, with under uh, rain, all those conditions need to be adhered to for the environmental. It must be between 102, 132 volts and between 47 and 63 Hertz. You must have an adequate fuel supply so that you can run the boiler all the way up to high fire. You must have an adequate feed water supply so that you can supply that to a steam boiler. There has to be enough load on the boiler so you can commission the entire curve, have a stack analyzer present and have a good knowledge of what fuel flow you need for low fire and high fire and a means of clocking it. There are prerequisites for the LMV3 VSD for the PWM, and those are detailed in the commissioning sections. When an LMV3 is powered up and wired correctly, it will just say off unprogrammed. That simply means that the unit's in standby and has not yet been fully commissioned. There are various stages of commissioning and until you're completely commissioned, you will always get the off unprogrammed. In this manual, the technical instructions, we don't deal with the heavy oil fuel trains, options number 23 to 27. These are available, but rarely used in the United States. And if assistance required for any specific questions on heavy oil trains, contact SEC. Let's take a look at a typical modulating gas pilot ignition number two. This would consist of two main fuel valves, upstream and downstream. And then you see our actuator. We have some high and low gas pressure switches and we see it feeds the burner. In the middle between that, we have the valve proving pressure switch if the valve proving option is used. Additionally, for a GP2, we have a pilot train on here and that's taken off ahead of the main gas valves. That's what makes this a gas train two for the US. Gas train one per Europe the pilots would actually come off between the main fuel valves. In the US, we always come off ahead of the main fuel valves. Available, but rarely used in the United States, is an additional SV safety valve. This would be a valve that's positioned outside the building, commonly used in Europe and other parts of the world, to shut off the gas supply to the burner when the burner's not in operation. In the United States, we usually have gas pressure available to the gas train right at the boiler, and we simply use the two blue gas valves you see there. So the SV valve, uh, called the safety valve, is rarely used in the US, but available on the LMV3. Today, we're gonna focus on fuel train number three. As again, I told you it was a GP2 mod. In the example for commissioning today, we're gonna use a fuel actuator and an air actuator. You have an optional VSD or PWM. In this case, we're not going to use it today. We'll cover that during the VSD section. The servos. The servos have um, descriptions. The descriptions of the rotation clockwise and counterclockwise are when the servo is viewing you, such as on the left, when the shaft is pointed at your eye. So that would be clockwise from nine o'clock to noon or counterclockwise from noon to nine o'clock. They have indexes. So again, when you look at your parameter, you would look at parameter number 602, and then the index 00 would be the fuel actuator, and 01 would be the air actuator. And then finally, you set the value zero or one, and that would set the air or the fuel actuator to clockwise or counterclockwise rotation. This would be done in anticipation of commissioning the burner, getting ready for a startup. The LMB3 also has actuators. All of the actuators on the LMB3 have to have a referencing. Referencing 
is a range of operation that is outside the 90 degree operational window. So you see it goes below nine o'clock, which is eight o'clock or above noon, which is like the one o'clock setting. If you're operating in the clockwise rotation, the one o'clock setting would be a reference open. If you're operating in the counterclockwise rotation, then referencing open would be at the eight o'clock range. Again, these have indexes. So you'd go to parameter 601, and then the index would choose either air or gas. And then finally, the value would choose either open or closed for referencing. Throughout the LMV3, we have phases, just like the LMV5, all of the Siemens products have phases that they go through. Here in blue, you're gonna see a standby phase. 30s, again, are the pre-purges, 40s are pilots, 50s are mains, 60s are runs, and finally 70 for shutdown. Each one of these phases has a parameter associated with it. In this case, fuel zero gas, and you see parameter 213 will set the length of the home run phase. Parameter 214 will let you clear like an air pressure switch during standby on return back home. Parameter 225 sets the length of your pre-purge. All of these parameters would be set during the commissioning process. There's factory defaults and there are items that need to be changed uh, for every burner. You can adjust the parameters for each and every phase that the LMV3 goes to. That's what makes it so flexible. All right, here's our burner. We're gonna do commissioning. We've got off unprogrammed in front of us. If you push the F and the A key together and release, the screen will flash code and it'll come up with blanks up there ready for you to enter the code. By pushing the plus key or the minus key, you can dial up the code, in this case, E for entry. And then you would hit the enter key and then the end E would get entered. You do the same thing for N, T, R, Y, and when all the elements are in there, you hit enter one more time, it'll flash parameters and it'll go into the 400 set. You are now logged in at the OEM level. You will remain logged in long as you, and you, without pressing any keys for the time of parameter 127. The factory default happens to be 60 minutes. That's adjustable and you can make it whatever you like. From the 400 set, if we enter the 400 set, the first thing we'll get prompted for is 201, which has no value at the moment. 201 is your fuel train. If we enter 201, we'll get our dashes. And then if we push plus or minus, we can dial up the fuel train number that we want. Today, we're gonna to do fuel train number three, gas pilot number two for the US. Once you get the three entered in there, you'll have to hit enter. When you hit enter, the number three will slide over to the right as a value. And then if you press escape, now you can review that parameter 201 is in fact set up to be a value number three for the GP2 gas train. You have now selected fuel series three. Once you have that in there, you go plus, and the first thing you'll be prompted for is 542. 542 means a value of zero, means that there is no VFD or PWM. That's gonna be the case today, so we're gonna continue with plus. When we do plus, now we're prompted for 641. 641 with a value zero means we don't have to standardize. 542 equals zero, so we don't have a VFD, so we don't need to standardize it. We'll continue with a plus. First thing we get prompted for is the ignition settings. P0 is the ignition settings. Hold the A key and hold the plus or the minus and dial up what you want for the air damper setting. In this case, one degree. Release it, then hold the F key and then go plus or minus while you're holding the F key and you can dial up the fuel, the butterfly valve for the 
gas actuator. Here we have P0 set at one degree of gas and one degree of air for the ignition setting on the light off of this burner. Once we have that adjusted the way we like, we'll do plus, we'll continue. And then we get prompted for a high fire setting. We're trying to bracket in the fuel curve. My suggestion for running the high fire setting is to enter the same values as you did on the ignition setting. Once we get the burner lit, then I suggest we go out to high fire and find our high fire part of the range. And then we can build a curve on the way back down. There's many ways to build a curve. This is the suggested way of building the curve, the easiest, uh, unless you know exactly where your high fire is going to be. So here we have it adjusted, and we do hold the F and we adjust it, and then we hold the A and we can adjust that, and we can get the settings exactly as we want. There's your P9 setting with the identical settings of ignition, one degree of air, one degree of gas. High fire setting is now complete. If we go plus, the screen will come up and say we're ready to run. And now we do an enter and we get standby phase 12. So you see again, standby phase 12 is the beginning. We're, we're ready to get a call for heat. We're gonna start to sequence the boiler. Phase 12 standby. We make the burner switch, which probably completes the call for heat from the external load control. Goes to phase 24. See it's sequencing on the bottom. Goes to phase 30, which is pre-purge. Right now we got 19 seconds. We're doing a countdown for the pre-purge. Then we drive it down to the ignition setting, which is phase 36. And then we camp at the ignition position and it will flash P0 forever. It will simply wait for you until you're ready to light off the burner. It's prepared the chamber, it's purged the chamber, it's ready for a light off. It's asking you to review the setting because we're gonna go light off the burner with these settings in place. And so it's giving you a quick review and it's flashing, waiting for you to proceed. Sequence through purge, hold that P0. If we do a plus from here, it starts to go into phase 38, turns on the ignition. If you look at the top, we have a bar up there that says the envelope, that's a call for heat. We see the blower light, the blower symbol has a bar below it. So now we know the blower is running. And in phase 38, we have the ignition symbol and we have a bar below it saying that the ignition is energized. These status bars are great status coming directly off the LMB telling us exactly what the LMB chassis is doing. It goes into phase 40. 40 is shown by a valve on there. It looks like a bow tie and 40. And if we get 40 energized with the ignition, we're gonna get a flame signal in 42. And then 44, we're going to stabilize our pilot and the LMB will camp there on the pilot asking us how we like the pilot settings. At this point, it's established a pilot, it has a flame signal and it's flashing P0. And that indicates that it's ready to adjust or to proceed with the programming. We can continue with plus. In this case, we do a plus and if any adjustments are needed on the pilot, um, we're just going to adjust the air. We don't want to adjust the fuel because we're just standing on the pilot and the air damper's in there. So you can adjust the pilot gas pressure and you can adjust the air damper, but don't make any butterfly setting because there is no fuel valve energized. So we just make adjustments to the air setting. In this case, we made it like 1.1 degrees. We had a minor adjustment on the air. Press plus, and then we go to phase 50, which turns on the main fuel valve. So now we're 50, the main fuel valve is energized, and now you can make adjustments 
In this case, we only adjust the fuel. The air has been set for the pilot. If we make adjustments to the air, then the next time we light a pilot, we might have a problem keeping the pilot alive. So whatever we arrived for the air pressure for the pilot, we have to live with that for the main fuel valve for the ignition setting. So here we will just adjust only the fuel valve and get the ignition setting. Again, all these modifications are just P0 for the pilot and the main, and we're fine tuning the gas butterfly and the air damper setting for a repeatable ignition. We press plus, we continue. Now we have P0, gives us a chance to make adjustments. We have 1.8 is what we ended up with and 1.1. We do a plus. From here, if you do a plus, it will automatically copy those settings to P1. So P1 was empty previous to this, and we got our ignition settings, and whatever ignition settings we had, as a courtesy, it brings them over and it gives us those exact same settings for P1. Now we have the ability on P1 to make adjustments. We can adjust the air or the fuel at low fire. It might be that ignition was very rich or maybe very lean. Whatever your burner likes for a nice repeatable light off all the time. We're not overly concerned with the exact combustion on the ignition. We just want a repeatable, steady, strong light off so that your boiler lights every time. Once you get to P1, then you may wanna dial this down a little bit so that when you release the modulate, you get the full, benefit of the turndown of the burner that you're programming. So whatever your maximum turndown is, that's what you're gonna set for P1. Once you have settings of P1 in there, then you're gonna say plus, and a calc is going to appear. When it says calc, now it's programmed, it's calculated P2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 in a straight line to the P9 that you already had existing. So now you see P2 is virtually the same because we have a very flat curve, quite flat at this point. You see P0 is our ignition settings, P1 was the same settings, maybe minor changes, P9 was our initial flat settings, and we have a very flat curve. Navigate to point number nine, go plus, 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 and you see that we're out there with our initial ignition settings. And then advance the air and the gas until you get to high fire. Wait for P9 to flash so that the settings of high fire are validated. In this example, we're at 75 degrees, and 82 degrees for high fire for this particular burner example. Now our curve has a rather wicked L shape, perfectly flat. And then when it gets to point number nine, it, it goes up into high fire. This is a bit of precarious curve and you wanna be careful when you're handling this curve because you don't wanna transition from P9 to P8. That would be a rather uh, abrupt uh, transition. So we navigate to point number nine and we drive it up the high fire. We wait for it to flash. Now we're there. And then we're going to hit the minus key. We're going to hold it until we get a calc on our screen. And we're going to recalculate 8765432. Here's an example. Minus says calc. And you see P8 is very nearly the P9 setting, just a slight drop on its way back down to P1. This is what our curve looks like. If you would do a key press and just say minus and release it, you would plunge from the P9 settings all the way back down to P8. I don't want you to do that. What I want you to do is hold it until it says calc, and now we just made a straight line back. So P9 is an anchor. 
That's going to be the high fire setting. It only changes when you change it. P1 is an anchor. It only changes when you change it. P2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 are soft and can be calculated. So here we did a P9. We did a calc and it calculated 8765432. Big difference between key press and key hold, which is go from point to point or do a calculate. You can also calculate in the positive direction. If you were at P1 and you edited P2, then you could do an up calc by holding the plus until the screen says calc and it'll recalculate three, four, five, six, seven, eight back to one of the anchors. You can do an up or a down calc. Here's what our curve looks like after the calc. I've broken off the P0 separately because the P0 is just an ignition setting. Your curve really consists of um, P1 through P9. It's always a nine point curve, never more than nine points, never less than nine points. The firing rates are associated in there. So P1 is 20%, P9 is 100%. These are just what the AZL will indicate and really have nothing to do with the turndown of your burner. You could have a three to one turndown, but P1 is always gonna read 20, or you could have 10 to one turndown and P1 is gonna read 20%. The LMB3 has fixed percentages for the firing rates. You went down and you edited point number eight so that you had the combustion that you like. Now you've got point number eight is edited. You have a new number eight. Now you have two choices. If you just hit enter minus, then you simply go back to the OP7. So now you have eight, nine, and then you have number eight that you edited. And then if you didn't calculate, then number seven would go right back to that straight line curves, just as all the existing points are. What I'd recommend you do is instead do a calc when you're sitting on eight. So hold minus until the screen says calc, and then it will recalculate 765432. I would do that on the entire way home. I would hold your fuel pretty steady and leave it and make all of your combustion corrections with your air damper and recalculate as you go so that you actually get a curve fit so that it fits the combustion of your burner. Once we have the curve complete, P1 through P9, each point must flash to be validated. If you lose your flame or you lose your load or your burner turns down for any reason, all of your data is retained but your points are not validated until they flash with that setting in there. So you have to flash on P8, flash on P9. And I don't care if you flash from P1 through P9 or P9 to P1, either direction, so long as every single point in your curve has flashed before you leave the curve so that they're all valid combustion points. The curve is completed and validated. If you press escape, then you'll get 546. It's asking you for load limits. 546 is your upper load limit. 545 is your lower load limit. Go to 546, hit enter, you get dashes, adjust it to 100%, hit enter so it keeps it. Escape, you get 546 with its value. In this case, you see there's no index, it's just a parameter and a value. Then you hit plus and you get prompted for 545, which is your lower load limit. Hit enter, adjust it to 20%, hit enter, press escape, and now you see 545 has a value of 20. Escape and escape, and now you're in operation and you stay at 20%, and now you're at the mercy of your load controller and it's operating at 20%. You want to shut down the burner now, you lose your call for heat, you turn off your burner switch, satisfy your load, and the unit will cycle back to the off. So it's in operation now, which is phase 60. It goes to phase 62, which is drive to low fire. Phase 70, it goes into afterburn. 
Phase 70 is a phase that allows some residual flame signal to carry before the post purge. So on oil, you usually need a few seconds. On gas, you pretty much lose the flame signal pretty instantaneously. Then you go into 72, you begin your post purge. 74 is some more optional or mandatory post purges. And 78, this has to do with FGR and with um, restarts. Then you go back to phase 10, you wrap around the blue band, you finish 78, you go back home. Home brings the servos home, make sure the air pressure switch turns off, um, make sure the flame signal's gone, everything is ready, and the servos go back to their home positions. And then you have off on your screen, and off at this point indicates that you have a fully commissioned burner. Previous to this, we had off and programmed, but now the burner is fully commissioned to an off status and it is ready to run. There's a free Excel spreadsheet that's up on our website that you can use, and it'll help you put in your fuel values, such as clocking your meters, your points on there, and then you can document your fuel, air, and VSD positions. And this would give you some idea what kind of burner head pressures you could expect, what the resultant boiler horsepower would be, or the steam flow, and your output in megawatts or millions of BTUs. And if you clock your meter, how many cubic feet of gas? It's a very convenient spreadsheet. It's a very nice uh, documentation of your burner curve. This would be an example of what a fuel curve would look like with fuel, air, and in this case, an additional VSD. You fully commissioned your burner. I highly recommend you back it up. You can do a backup or restore. So now your screen says off. You press F and A, come up to the 400 set. You say minus, 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 and you get down to the zero, zero set. You hit enter, and it comes up with parameter 41 in the zero set. And then you can do plus, 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 and you get the parameter number 50. 50 is the one we want. When you hit enter on 50, it's going to prompt you for a backup. Here you get to choose between backup or restore. So we'll go back to backup. We'll hit enter on backup. We'll get a value of zero, which means leave me alone. We get to enter it, make it a value of one. When we hit enter, it now does the backup, comes back with a minus 26 and then a zero. And now the backup is complete and we can escape and go back. So the complete backup was done by going to parameter 50, making it a one and letting it return back to zero. If you go to parameter 55 and you hit enter, you see there's a value in there now, in this case, 26755. That's your burner ID. Parameter 113 is the burner ID on the LMV3. Parameter 55 is the burner ID of the parameters that are in that AZL. So what it does is it's telling you which burner that burner that AZL has parameters for. Just like the LMV5, it never ever runs the AZL and the AZL can be removed at any time. But if you'd ever do a restore, you would get the parameter set that was gathered from this burner with the ID number 26755. Let's take a look at manual operation. When you wanna put your boiler in manual operation, hold the F key. And while you're holding the F key, adjust the load number. So holding the F, then you go plus or minus, and you can set a load value in there somewhere between 20 and 100. In this case, we'll go to 26% fire rate. We'll release. And now the unit goes back and it operates and it stays at 26 fire rate. What it does is 26.0 flashes while it's running in manual. This indicates that your burner's in manual operation. A flashing operation percent means that you're manually being fired at that percentage. To go back to automatic, you hold escape about eight seconds. Then your screen will go blank. 
you release. And now it says operate 26%. And the display is solid. And that indicates that you're in automatic operation and you're at the mercy of the load controller. Let's take a look at one more parameter that I think is a good one to have knowledge about. Parameter number 942. It's a service level parameter. So you have to log in at service level and it's called the active load source. It's a read only parameter. You can't make any adjustments to this, but it's telling you who's in charge of the burner firing rate. If you get a value of five, that means that you're getting a three position input on terminal X503, which is a bump up and bump down. That's how you modulate a burner off of 503. That's the lowest level of modulation that you can do, and it's available on the LMV37s. If you display a value of four, that means that you have a valid four to 20 modulation signal coming in on X64 on the LMV3. A four to 20 modulation signal will override any float bump commands on X503. So four to 20 has a higher priority and it overrides the mode five below it. So if you get a mode four in there, and now you know that there's a valid four to 20 being presented on your LMV3. If you get a three, that means that somebody's coming in on Modbus X92 and they're giving it a Modbus firing rate. Modbus overrides four to 20. So Modbus has a higher priority. And if Modbus exists on your job, is going to have a higher authority and it's going to have control of the burner firing. You can override this with manual if you so choose. Now that's where you hold the key and you dial in a load setting and manual overrides Modbus, which overrides milliamp, which overrides three position. Finally, if you have a number one in there, that means that somebody's working on the fuel curve. When you're working on the fuel curve, you're the king. The fuel curve commands the firing rate and it has priorities over all other firing rate modes. So 942 is a good tattletale telling you exactly who's modulating the burner and why you're at the specific fire rate that you are. Okay, that completes the programming, a quick overview of that. Next week, we're gonna do troubleshooting, section six, and we're gonna follow with two more sessions for the VFD and for Modbus. Thanks, we'll take questions and answers. Back to you, Aaron. All right, thank you, Dave, that was very good. Uh, we got a few good questions during that presentation, so let's jump in. Looks like there's two or three of them here. Uh, should be able to get through, through these pretty quickly. Uh, the first is, and I guess you talked about this just a little bit, but perhaps you can elaborate. How can I transfer a parameter set from one LMV to another? Uh, can you do a backup? And I said, and I hope you do. <laughs> what you're going to do is if you walk into a hospital and you've got three burners, you can commission the first burner and then you can copy that setup down to the sister burners, number two and number three down the line, and then put in your analyzer and touch up the fuel curves. Plus, if for any reason a burner would go down, you can replace it with a new chassis and dump the exact program in there, turn the burner switch on, and you're all set to go. Yes, you have the option of backing this up to a computer. You have to buy a cable a rather expensive cable at that. And then you have to have the free software that you can put on your PC. And then you could back up every burner that you've ever done. And you could print out a document of all the settings. So I highly recommend the PC backup so that you as a rep or an owner would have a backup of all the burners and boilers in your building or your jurisdiction. Process, you go to parameter number 50. When you set 50 to backup, it takes the copy of the LMV parameters and puts them into the AZL. When you say restore, it takes them from the AZL and puts it back down into the burner. So the only way you can do a backup on a burner is if you have a burner ID. You can run an LMB3 without a parameter 113, but you can't back it up until you give it a name. Once you do, if you're gonna replace the chassis, you must first put in the same burner ID, 76542, whatever the burner ID is, and then you go to parameter 50 and then it will download and say, yep, I'm on the right burner and it restores the parameter set that was in the AZL. 
So I always do a backup on the job site. And if you ever do a replacement, all you have to do is change the burner ID on the new chassis and then do a download. Cool, very good. And um, you'll, you'll talk more about the PC backup, I think during the ACS 410 session of this coming up in a few weeks, but uh, that's, a, that's a great overview, thank you. Um, all right, how about which parameters can I adjust with the service password versus the OEM password? Uh, and then a second part to that, does the OEM password allow access to all parameters? Um, service, so it's user level. You can look at things like how many faults do I have, some basic overviews. Uh, when you go into the service level, now you can access um, your combustion curve. You can do your tune-ups and you have much deeper access. And if you go to the parameter list, you can see that the service has more deep access that the user wouldn't have unless you knew the password. When you go into the OEM level, then you can access every parameter that's in the book. That would be more critical ones like flame failure response time. Factory default is one second. In the United States, you can go up to four seconds for factory uh, flame failure response time. Anything that's more critical, they put in at the OEM level. And mostly the technician wouldn't have to access that, but the OEM might do that when it sets up the original burner. So OEM has access to everything, service, all the stuff that the typical service man would do. And if you don't know any passwords, you can only get to the user info level. Okay, very good. And it looks like our last question for today then, uh, it's kind of along those same lines to a degree. Can an individual curve point be changed after a burner is commissioned? Yes, excellent question. So you get your burner commissioned, you're up and running. Now you come in, you do an annual tune-up and you wanna make some changes. Get your burner up and running. Once it's running, you do the F and A, and you get 400 set, you hit enter, and then you hit enter, and it just takes you right to the curve hot while the burner is running. You can take a look at all your different points in the curve. You can toggle through point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3, point 0.4, and you can check all of your combustion. If you feel a change needs to be done, you can hold the F key and adjust the air, I mean the fuel, and you can hold the A key and adjust the air. Once you make an adjustment on any particular point, you must wait for it to flash, and then if you escape back out, now you have an updated curve. You only need to validate the points that you make changes to. If you ever change a point and the burner's not running or you don't wait until it flashes, all of the data, the curve is kept in the LMV, but none of it is validated. And when you look back at the screen, it's gonna stay off unprogrammed and meaning you have to go through the commissioning of the curve and validate the points. All the data is there, but it becomes invalid because you can't make adjustments until you let it flash with fire in a hole. So you can always go edit a hot curve anytime you want for tune-ups, easy to do. So Dave, I wanna add one quick question to that because I think I've heard this asked in tech support from time to time. If someone were to come into a, an LNV or a burner rather that had an LNV, which had a curve and they came in and made, the, made a change to a curve point as you described, but they moved out of it too quickly before it flashed or validated, then the LMV would say off UPR, off on program. Is there any way to easily know that, uh, that that was the cause or would you get into the curve and then kind of identify that in some capacity? How would that work? No, you wouldn't be able to tell specifically. Um, you would be off on program when you shut the unit off because it would come back and say it's not ready to run. All of your curve data would still be there um, and you wouldn't know which point you didn't validate you simply have to go and revalidate every single one again, all P0 through P9. Um, of course, that would never happen to you because you would just do a backup restore and you just recover where you were. So if you're gonna go in and do a tune-up, the first thing you do is back up what you got. Then you go manipulate the curve as needed. And then if you like it, then back it up again. Yeah, very good. I like that advice. That's a, it never hurts to do a backup, right? It's free Never hurts to do a backup. You go in and just recover where you are. So at least, say you get two points into your curve and the guy says, oh my gosh, boiler three went down or they increased the, the uh, process in the factory. I need my boiler back. Then you say, fine. I just restore it to the way it was when I walked in the room. I'll come back another day and do the tune-up later. Yeah, great point. Great point. Cool. Well, that looks like all the questions we have for today. So uh, gosh, thank you, Dave. It was a great presentation and uh, thanks for the, the thoughtful answers to these questions. Uh, thank you to each of you in the audience for joining us today. We very much appreciate that.
Um, even though next Monday is Labor Day and many of us will be off work, we will be right back here on Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time for the next session in this series where Dave's going to cover, cover troubleshooting. So please join us for that. Make plans to do so. If you can't join us for that, it will be on YouTube within a few days after the presentation, as all of these are. Uh, so thank you to each of all, each and every one of you again, and hope you have a great week. Thanks, everyone.